Virginia has the first question. So Virginia, somebody? No, it's being brought to you. We're making a lot easier. Hi. Um, that was very interesting, and thank you very much. Um, in your talk, you didn't make much of the distinction between speech and other kinds of uh, questions where toleration might come up. Uh, and I wanted to ask you whether you think if you did just concentrate on speech, um, it would be easier to uh, solve some of the problems and have fewer paradoxes about how to interpret things. As you no doubt know, the American legal system takes the right to free speech as very absolute. Uh, and the arguments for that are that um, wrong speech should be answered by more speech rather than suppression, and uh, appeals are made to John Stuart Mill's type of argument that mm, the way to deal with wrong, uh, wrong arguments is to get more arguments out there, wrong and right, uh, and one can well argue that government doesn't have to just take a passive role of allowing good arguments to be made. It could be more actively <coughs> presenting good arguments for basic liberal principles or whatever. Uh, and if you uh, um, agree that, uh, well, at an empirical level, it's better to have the wrong speech out there and answered um, <coughs> than suppressed, then would you be able to handle um, the arguments um, better than are suggested by your talk? Or do you think all the same problems that you outlined would apply as seriously if you just concentrated on speech? Yeah, okay. uh, I'd like to answer that and I'll also say something about things. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, so thanks. Um, I, I do think that we restrict ourselves uh, in um, uh, thinking about toleration too much if we only think about tolerating speech. Mm -hmm. um, uh, apart from the fact that speech and practice uh, is, is hard to uh, distinguish um, uh, because a number of speeches immediately are not just practices but lead to, um, lead to certain um, um, Practices. Um, I think the the, um, um, the the examples that I gave are not. Um, um, they, they all uh, focus on a certain practice um, uh, that is to be tolerated or not uh, um, or not tolerated, not just on speech. So, but you are right that the question of the toleration of speech is an important question here. However, um, the argument that you give for why should we should tolerate the speech, uh, and it is the classic million argument, I'm not so sure. Um, there is a good case you can make for why it is beneficial um, for learning processes uh, to have wrong positions but someone could make a case that for completely wrong positions, which we know to have been wrong for 500 years, the epistemic value of having them out is close to zero. What? Of the epistemic value of having these, uh, these beliefs and opinions voiced all the time again, uh, the epistemic value is, could be close to zero. Um, so if the epistemic point is the main point, we would open up a big uh, can of worms, if that's the right uh, expression, uh, because we would, we would give a bigger benefit to uh, the uh, positions which have not been refuted many times. Um, and so um, I don't think that argument would make for an absolute uh, um, um, right to freedom of speech. Then is there an absolute right to the freedom of speech? Uh, I don't think so. Um, uh, there is no right to insult people if from that insult um, uh, big harm or wrongs uh, can result. Um, so there are a number of contexts in which um, 
uh, in which our speech um, um, is, is inadmissible uh, and sometimes ought to be, uh, ought to be regulated. There, there, there are lots of laws about racist speech. Um, generally, as well as in particular contexts, if in, as, as happens in, uh, in, in soccer games, uh, well, it used to happen all the time, but now uh, there's, there's, a, there's much more uh, uh, screening here. Uh, but if John Terry uh, from Chelsea insults, uh, insults uh, another player with a racist uh, remark, nowadays he's banned for a few games. Um, um, so, uh, uh, so, so, uh, it, you know, you can't appeal to free uh, to free speech in that uh, in that context. So, so, um, so, a number of, of of answers. I want I want to talk about practices, not just about speech only. Uh, I think the epistemic arguments for toleration have, have limits. Um, there is epistemic value in a free debate, uh, but uh, well, someone. Uh, could also say there is epistemic value in constraining debates because otherwise the learning takes place by uh, not always starting over again. Uh, so if it's a, if it's a mainly epistemic argument, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's, it's um, the scope is um, um, is big enough. And also about the absolute uh, right to free speech, I have some uh, reservations. Can I just briefly because I, I'm, I'm so grateful for. Adam's remarks uh, say something about um, uh, the points he raises. I, um, um, I shook my head and I shouldn't have. I apologize when you talked about fallibilism because I don't think Bale's argument is about fallibilism. Fallibilism is the view that you might be wrong and the others might be wrong. But that's not Bale's view. Um, Bale was a fideist. He <coughs> believed that if you have strong religious faith, you do not believe the other faith might be right and you may be wrong. He just was pointing out that holding on to your faith as a truth, you have to know that it is faith and not knowledge that you hold on to. Um, but that doesn't mean you believe that the other religion might be right. You, you have no reason to believe that uh, for faith. You might come into a process where you start to believe that. But that's not necessary to be tolerant. What's necessary to be tolerant is to know that your firm belief in the truth is faith, um, is based on faith. Um, and then you can be a firm believer. You don't have to be a fallibilist. I think it, it refers to the point just raised. If uh, the argument for toleration would center on fallibilism, um, I think that's a very shaky ground. Uh, to, to ask a religious believer that he should be tolerant in the sense of um, leaving open the possibility that he's completely wrong and the others might at the end of the day hold on to the true belief. That seems to me uh, the imposition of a, of a view that we hold in theoretical debates uh, or scientific debates and project it onto religion. I, I don't think that, uh, that, uh, that works. Um, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not what, you know, it doesn't get to the, what's animating. Um, religion, but that's that's true. so 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 the million and popularian scheme is not the Bayesian scheme. Um, is it your? It's not your scheme either. Right. I, I think the Rawlsian, Bayesian, and Forstian scheme is very different. You hold on to the truth, uh, um, um, uh, but you know what kind of truth it is. Um, it, right. Okay. Okay. Let me introduce your comments to him. Right. After each, after each question, so we just get some more. Good. Um, please also introduce yourselves before your question. Um, I'm so sure. Wait till you get the, uh, oh. the uh, microphone. Um, I think the two concepts are very important. Oh, I'm so sure Schwartz and Bach will also be here. Um, the two concepts are important. I guess I'm, uh, there seems to be, and this is particularly perhaps um, typical of American society, they seem to be tolerant of all sorts of things, and I'm wondering if you want to call it tolerant still. It's, I think, a result of the super individualism, lack of, you know, the ignorance, lack of education. Um, in Mississippi, they're bo they were voting, I don't know what happened, uh, about whether to get rid of the public school system. Right? 
Now, so there is a danger that, I mean, we're always talking about culture and religion, but there's a slippage into other areas. We also tolerate extreme inequalities in wealth, and if you do studies, Americans are far less upset that, you know, on average with that than other um, countries. And I'm just wondering if this, this, well, there's sort of a question I have for you, and then I just wanted to make a point. Um, the question is, there's this slippage of sort of toleration talk into areas that makes me feel very uncomfortable. Even Rawls at one point says uh, we should, philosophy, you know, the, the principle of toleration should be applied to philosophy, and that comes back to the question of truth again, uh, which is a little worrisome, and evidence, I guess, if, if Adam has been, and also it just seems instead of stressing the right of justification, all this and everyone, I mean, that's important, but just a good school system would bring about a decent toleration between citizens more. And I think the problem is the danger of collective political action when we become sort of systematically tolerant of all sorts of odd behaviors. And gun can, guns is another one, being able to. Right? So that's sort of the danger. And I'm just wondering why is toleration always about religion and consciousness and we don't get down to some other real practical issues that are, okay. Is that it? Yes. Okay, Thank you. well, thanks so much, and it's also a pleasure to meet you. Um, um, the examples you give um, are examples um, of basic institutions of the justice of society. Um, and my argument, um, and that refers to, to Adam's essential question, which I might uh, get to, uh, is an argument about justice. It is an imperative of justice to regard others as justificatory equals and be willing, when it comes to basic questions of the justice of the framework we share, the political and social framework we share, um, to um, argue for your position uh, with reasons that respect others as equal citizens um, um, in not denying them an effective right to justification and all the rights that on that basis can be justified as what it means to be um, a full and equal citizen in what I call a basic structure of justification. So, on that basis, um, the realm of reasonable disagreement is the realm where um, questions of the good life, questions of religious truth, questions of cultural identity are exchanged. When it comes to question of what is essential for the basic stru structure of a society that aims at realizing justice, the realm of reasonable disagreement is still there, but it shrinks. There is no reasonable disagreement about uh, denying others uh, basic standing as an equal citizen. Um, so um, so the, the toleration of huge social inequalities or arguments for it falters on uh, the definition of justice that is also the basis of my view. Uh, of toleration. There are some things we will endlessly reasonably disagree about, but some things we ought not. Um, and Adam and you asked me, how do we distinguish um, those? So just a few words. Adam says, well, we accept these liberal values, and we, what, what kind of justification do we have for it, and what kind of justification do we, do we um, owe others who don't share these values? Now, I neither think that my argument is based on values, nor do I think that they are liberal values. Uh, I do not believe in a liberal notion of autonomy in the sense that you ought to be the author of your life in order for that life to be a good one, uh, whatever that actually means to be the author of your life. Most of the world, as far as I know, our lives are being written by others, not by ourselves. Um, so um, the argument is based on a principle. What kind of principle is that? The principle is what I call the principle of justification. And the idea of 
that book also why it's so long is, if we understand that the question of toleration is really the question of the justification of the norms that we, with good reasons, ought to accept as being subject to and as being the authors of. The justifications for toleration that have been given historically, epistemic ones, religious ones, many others, draw the limits too narrowly. Um, the epistemic arguments draw the limits where obviously stupid or refuted positions are being voiced. Should we not tolerate them? No. Uh, a religious argument is not a reciprocal argument because someone makes a, an argument for toleration on the basis of charity, but for an argument for toleration to be, uh, to be a valid argument, it, it has to be shareable by the person who is, with, lives with you in a common framework. So um, a religious argument can be a good argument for those who believe in that religion. As a reciprocal, reciprocally valid argument, it's not sufficient. So the book argues that the principle upon which we should try and rest the proper justification of toleration is the principle of justification itself. So it's a recursive argument that, that if you like, um, cleanses or um, gets rid of a number of moral, ethical, religious, epistemic, whatever arguments, pragmatic, for toleration by always playing out what the principle of justification itself um, uh, harbors as a normative um, as a normative principle. So for me, the principle of justification is a principle of reason and of morality. It says that um, the right to justification, which is, is um, follows from the principle of justification, says that no one ought to be subjected to norms um, that cannot be justified to him or her reciprocally and generally. So that principle, of course, says that towards the fascist, we apply the same principle um, as towards uh, liberals, who might not always be happy with the argument that follows from the principle of justification. The principle of justification favors those arguments where um, reciprocity means you are willing, first, to accept the other as an equal citizen in the justificatory scheme. So the fascist has a problem already here. Um, that you provide uh, arguments which do not reproduce the beliefs that are precisely contended. Uh, if you make an argument about the nature of marriage and use a religious argument, what that nature is, towards someone who doesn't uh, believe in that religion, it's not a good argument. It's a good argument for how you lead your life and who you marry or whether you marry, but it's not a good argument for a common framework of regulating an institution such as a marriage. There are epistemic uh, differences in a reciprocity. Someone who appeals to an equality has a reciprocal advantage over someone who appeals to a metaphysical or religious view um, of the nature of, of, um, of something. So the criteria of reciprocity and generality um, plus the uh, criterion of respect for others as justificatory equals are the material by which we decide the normative and epistemic quality of arguments that are being given for same-sex marriage, against same-sex marriage. We look at these arguments that are given for the crucifixes on the wall, against the crucifixes on the wall. Do each party there use religious arguments? No. For the same-sex marriage, you don't have to use a religious argument, and you don't have to use an anti-religious argument about marriage. You make an argument about equal rights of people to engage in marriage. So you're not on the same plane as someone who argues for a religious, uh, but, but then there are other, and, and then there's a redefinition. People provide other arguments um, that have to do with, you know, the fate and well-being of children, all of these things. So these need to be um, um, looked at, and, and the idea is that um, reciprocity and generality are the essential um, criteria by which we can distinguish better and worse reasons. And the point of it is to say that the principle of justification is not a partial liberal principle. It is the, prin the principle of reason, which we recursively arrive at when we ask ourselves, what, does, what structure does an argument have to have in order to be valid 
in a context of regulating social life together. And there's an important implication, namely that these norms have to be acceptable and justifiable to all those who are subject uh, to them. And from that, a, re a recursive consideration of the kinds of equality, the kinds of standing, the kinds of status um, that are implied by that uh, follows. Okay, that was helpful. But um, I want everyone to be very brief in their questions. Um, Me too. Mm -hmm. You said it. Um, David. <clears throat> David Maney from the philosophy department. I think we need to dis I think it's important to keep in mind distinguishing who's doing the tolerating. Like there's a difference between what government should do, what society or civil society should do, and what the individual should do. For example, it seems to me that governments shouldn't ban fascist parties, because in my opinion, as a matter of process, government should shouldn't be in the business of deciding you know, which political philosophy is right. On the level of civil society, it appears to me that in order for civil society to be tolerant, it should exclude fascist parties because to even you know give them that time of error in terms of civil society would be to unduly affect the people they think should be disenfranchised. Well, in a crucifix, you know, it's not even intolerant or on a personal level. I mean, if it put a crucifix on my wall, then it does seem intolerant for government to put them in public office. So, is there anything if you could mention like what differences this could make in terms of who's doing the tolerating? Now, I'm very grateful for that uh, question. It's, it's a, and now I, I, I promise to be brief. Um, I, see, I see the distinction there. Um, Tolerant. I see the distinction, but I don't accept it in the way you suggested. Um, in my democratic conception, what the government does is what the citizens find to be justifiable um, in uh, um, uh, assessing their own and the reasons of others. The government is not a separate actor. That's something in which, in the toleration debate, many of my colleagues have a very hard time accepting. Uh, for many traditions, and for some reason, it centers on Britain. Uh, the question of toleration is the question of what a government thinks ad is admissible. For me, the question of the government as a separate entity arises sometimes, but not is not the general background of what I view. What a government does is what, in a democracy, citizens can justifiably demand from each other or accept. It's not a separate entity. It doesn't have separate considerations at its disposal. Also not when it comes to banning parties. If we were to accept that a government is an entity that has independent considerations of whether to ban a party from what civil society thinks right, I think that would be a dangerous move. Uh, but I do understand that there are contexts of toleration um, where um, it's a question of what you tolerate as an individual. It's a question what society ought to tolerate. So you, can, uh, you, can, you might say that as, a, as an individual, I will not tolerate uh, uh, that X says this and this. I will just go away or I will say, please be quiet. If we are a majority in civil society and and minorities say the same thing. I might not speak up openly because I might fear uh, that there's a silencing going uh, as a result, which I might not want. So the contexts are important. But giving, uh, seeing government as a separate agent, I have some trouble with. Thank you. Sheila? Um, yeah, hi. I'm Sheila Benavid. I'm a guest of this Malansori seminar. Um, Rani, we share so much, so I'm going to just um, ask you any, about a discussion recently in Germany, and I want to see how you're going to play through, you know, with your theoretical presuppositions. It's this discussion about circumcision. <laughs> well, um, for those who don't know, very, very briefly, a lower court in Germany actually ruled uh, that circumcision, you know, was. Uh, against the human rights of the Muslim children, male children involved in this case, that it inflicted irreversible bodily damage, etc. And this decision was just standing there in the public sphere with people very confused about it until the European Council of Rabbis, or maybe just the German Council of Rabbis, I may not have all the facts correctly here, intervened and say, what exactly are you saying? Because obviously, the practice is common both, you know, to um, Muslim and Jewish religions and so on and so forth. This, of course, caused this incredible 
you know, incredible debate. So um, I'm just going to ask you to sort of think this through for us and see where you come, where you come, you know, out on. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Uh, it is indeed uh, a, a recent debate in um, uh, in Germany. I think it is. Um, uh, people do blend over from the debate about female circumcision, and with this uh, event of this uh, decision of the lower court, suddenly ask themselves, "Oh, have we overlooked uh, this enormous practice?" Um, uh, and then lots of dynamics play themselves out. Uh, it, some anti-Muslim, some anti-Semitic, uh, and it's a complicated thing. But I don't want to say everyone who's concerned about this uh, is, is, uh, has anti-Semitic or anti-Muslim motives. There are people who say that often uh, circumcision of boys is being made under uh, difficult medical and hygienic conditions. And that was actually the case. Uh, there was an infection. And it hadn't been treated um, uh, early enough and, and properly, and the family didn't quite, you know. Uh, uh, so, so there was a medical, um, uh, a medical um, problem. Um, I think the difference between female and uh, male circumcision makes an essential difference. Um, the uh, limits of toleration are to be drawn where. Uh, basic rights of someone as an equal um, in um, uh, society are being infringed upon. And to these basic rights, it, uh, uh, we count the right that not others determine uh, about um, uh, your um, um, physical well-being and about the conditions of your physical well-being in a way that infringes upon that well-being uh, to a reciprocally um, unjustifiable extent. So I think that is the argument against uh, female circumcision. Um, it could also be the argument against male circumcision. And then the question is, is it also an argument against male uh, um, circumcision? And I think uh, the evidence that this infringes upon the well, the physical well-being, the physical integrity of men in the same way as it does in the female case, that uh, this is not a, this, that this argument cannot be made. Um, you, uh, if you if you would say it is a sim, uh, it, it is a it is an, people could then say okay it's not the it's not the same infringement, but it is still one that we should rule out. Um, um, then uh, we would have to ask is it is it really something that damages uh, the physical well-being? Um, uh, of boys, young men, and uh, and men, um, and as as far as I can uh, I can tell, uh, the evidence is not is not there if it is done uh, properly. So to avoid uh, infections and, and uh, physical uh, physical problems, as is true for any operation that's made on someone, any medical operation has uh, a potential. Um, risk of infection. I don't think it's a denial of, um, uh, of basic rights of the others to be uh, to be respected as uh, an, an equal um, and not to be treated uh, in a way that cannot be justified um, uh, to that person. But it is true um, that it is a long religious tradition uh, in which this is done does play a role. It does play a role not so much for respecting the tradition and the religion of the parents. It does play a role for respecting the identity of the child to be properly socialized into that uh, religion and not feel like an estranged um, uh, member who hasn't been brought up properly. That does play a role. But religion, when it comes to the question of physical well-being, as the case of female circumcision, shows is not a singular trumping uh, um, uh, argument uh, here. To point to the religious quality of a practice is important in the justificatory arrangement, but it's not a trumping argument. Okay, thank and, you. And I, we agree here too. Uh, Thomas, we have um, a bunch of um, interesting people who want to intervene. You're all interesting. So I hope to get as much of that. Uh, we're supposed to stop in about five or ten minutes and have our reception. So 
that's the speaker. Thomas Cook, Yale University, is this on? No, it's not. Somebody. It is. It's on, but it's not on. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the connection between respect and equality. Is it on now? Out of battery. Respect and equality. And I start with sort of what I take to be your donut conception of toleration. So as I see it, you have basically two circles, right? There are those people, or let's say those beliefs and behaviors that I accept, and those that I may object to in some way, but still find should be uh, tolerated, and I treat them equally in my society. Now, what seems to be wrong with that is that uh, people have different donuts, and these donuts are heterocentric, so they, their center is different, so they're slightly set off against each other. So my donut is a little bit different from your donut, and so on. And then it seems that even though I am willing to treat you as an equal in the first instance, I'm not willing to treat equally your donut. So you will say that certain people or certain positions, values, conducts should be uh, treated equally that do not belong into my outer circle of my donuts. So I don't think that they should be treated differently. They should be treated equally. And then basically by saying that my donut should prevail over your donut, I'm in effect still saying that you should not be treated fully equally. It's my donut in the end that prevails. And my donut is in the realm of what I accept as, true, as fully true, whereas your donut is in the realm of what, is, what I object to but tolerate. So that's where the inequality comes in. Uh, well, the inequality comes in with the question towards third parties. So I fully accept you. Right? I may disagree with you on some things, and, but I fully accept you as an equal. But there are people whom you think should be accepted fully, or whose beliefs ah. and conduct should be accepted fully, who I think should not be accepted fully, who I want to exclude. And so since, let's say, I prevail and the state get, gets fixed the way I want to fix or the way you want to fix, one of us wins, one of us loses, not in the first level, but at the second level about who should be in and who should be out. Right. Um, the, um, the ideal um, of, of toleration is indeed uh, that the basis on which we um, distinguish the donuts that are in and the, the donuts that are uh, well, actually, there are two out. There are two ins or two outs. There is what you um, uh, what you fully accept. Um, um, there is what you object to, but tolerate, and there is what you think is intolerable. That's outside the uh, So these are three realms, um, and in the realm, uh, in in both of the realms, what is to be tolerated and what is not to be uh, tolerated. Um, the task is that we, too, have different views about what it means to uh, respect a third donut. Um, we have not only to come uh, to terms with each other and find a common definition, we have to come to a definition with the third, too. Um, and that brings in the question of the exclusionary character. Um, of arguments for uh, toleration. So the argument is not that only these um, lines between these three realms are justified um, about which we do find a social consensus, because we will not find a social consensus. No. The argument is that the justifiability of these, um, uh, of, these of, the, of the limits of these uh, zones ought to be something which, ha which is of a particular quality. It is of a higher quality, especially when it comes to drawing the limits between what is tolerable and what is not tolerable. Those who are not tolerated um, will not agree with the way in which we draw um, um, these limits. Um, but the point is that we owe them, and I agree, we owe them a justification which does not deny their standing as equal citizens, but someone sometimes um, 
upholding the principle of equal citizenship means to make clear to a fascist that the practices he engages in are not acceptable. That is a sign of what it means to respect him as an equal citizen. We would disrespect him if we, owed, if we gave him no proper justification, which is a justification among equals. But the justification among equals as a fascist doesn't mean that I treat his views equally to mine. I treat him as someone who is an equal citizen and to whom I owe reasons for why I think that he behaves irresponsibly towards other citizens who, in some parts of Germany or take other countries, if they, ha if, if they ha have a certain color of skin, will not go out into a park um, in the night. Um, and so, so that's what it means to respect someone. It's not just that you respect the possible victim, it's really to respect um, uh, the one who has a wrong uh, belief too. But Thomas's question also re refers to what's in that middle realm of what is tolerated. Because what is tolerated um, uh, um, and in how far uh, it is tolerated, what, what kind of practices and what uh, amount, uh, uh, what, what scope of practices is, um, is tolerated um, will remain um, um, uh, disputed. Uh, but the um, the, the virtue of toleration, well, there are two, there are two different ways to look at it. Uh, according to a conception which I didn't spell out, the coexistence conception, we might come to a compromise between what you think is right uh, to uh, accept about the donuts of others and what I think is right. We could reach a compromise. So that would be a modus vivendi argument. It is possible to call that toleration too. Um, uh, but uh, on the respect conception, we would have to come uh, to uh, a justifiable conclusion uh, about what it means to respect other people's opinions. Thank you. I want to call one more uh, questioner, and everyone else will have to beseech him at the, at the reception. Richard. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll make it uh, brief. Richard Wall, from the Graduate Center. I just wonder. Uh, whether or not at times uh, remaining wedded to this principle of uh, justification and uh, indeed admirable conception of, kind of democratic norms that in the last analysis have to adjudicate these kinds of things, you're not at, at, at some point remaining at too high a level of abstraction. And it, it just keeps coming back through the back door or the window or wherever um, one could refer to Shayla's question about the, spirit, the specific instance of circumcision controversy a few months ago, but also all the German instances you give. And at some point, clearly, one has to have recourse to the notion of political culture and the uh, overcharged nature of certain political cultures in both the positive and the negative sense. I mean, I think, I think that you know, Anglo-American political culture have certain prejudices in favor of civil liberties on the basis of a, a kind of a ethical self-understanding at the same time. Of course, the, the German past um, has a whole series of taboos that make this issue, many of these issues about fascist parties, circumcision, uh, relations with Israel, how one criticizes Israel, um, you know, o overcharged, etc. So at, at some level, if one wants to really adjudicate the, these disputes, uh, one has to kind of wade into territory that, as you acknowledge, you know, in your book have to do with questions of, of the good and, and uh, ethical norms and, uh, you know, uh, we have to kind of, uh, you know, uh, sully our hands a bit. Well, I, I agree, but add a but. Every such conflict uh, is situated in, as you say, the context of a political culture um, with a certain history, uh, certain lines of conflict, which make a difference as to how we think about these conflicts. But without the adequate principles, the interpretation of what a political culture means um, um, is neither possible nor justifiable. Many of the uh, arguments 
for the crucifix, against the Muslim headscarf, against same-sex marriage, against minarets in Switzerland, against mosques in Cologne, are based on arguments about the political culture of Germany, Switzerland, France, and so on. Am I to say that these people misunderstood the political culture in which they live? No. They understand very well uh, what the political culture means. Like many of the Republicans, candidates and voters understand very well what the political culture in the Midwest uh, 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 in, in the Midwest, in some parts of the Midwest, consists of. So without the adequate principle of equal respect, of thinking through what a proper argument is, we run the danger of um, giving um, a, um, a priority to a conventional argument about what the political culture is. And then add to it, and I know you don't, you, that's not what you have in mind, but add to it uh, the so-called Birkenförde thesis, uh, which in Germany is an important, uh, uh, important idea. It is the idea that um, a liberal society depends upon Bindungskräfte, as Birkenförde said, um, forces of binding us together, which the liberal state cannot reproduce. So it is in need of a political culture support, supported by the churches, uh, uh, other uh, agencies of solidarity. So if you, which uh, uh, Birkenförde himself did, for example, in the headscarf uh, uh, question, not opt for the conservative position. But many have used his thesis to say, if you drive the toleration imperative higher and higher, and we accept mosques next to the dome in Cologne, uh, Muslim headscarves in school, same-sex marriage, these Bindungskräfte loosen. The liberal society, by being too liberal, dissolves itself. It's a, as you know, you're the expert also on the analysis of, of, of conservative uh, political ideas. So it's a, it's, a very common, it's a very common idea. So the problem uh, by saying uh, these arguments are all situated in a political culture um, is that without the proper principles, which have to rest on some uh, abstraction, but they need to be applicable to these uh, conflicts. I agree very much. But uh, to point to the political culture um, is not enough. Sometimes it, it, uh, it, leads, to, it leads us to be to be aware of the potential anti-Semitic background of certain arguments. Some, some people in that debate that Sheila was addressing to are saying, oh, if we think of our political culture and about the anti-Semitism in the political culture, we should be aware of that, but nevertheless not be distracted from the pure fact that here physical harm is done to people. Leave the anti-Semitism not, not aside for the moment, but, but don't use the anti-Semitism to, um, to weaken an argument which is a proper argument. So also people who are aware of the political culture background come to very different conclusions. Okay.